Well, praise the Lord and good evening to all our Bible study viewers. And I just want to welcome you all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I trust you've had a good day. Um, obviously, the lockdown has been lifted um, uh, since yesterday. And uh, maybe some of you have had to start going back to your offices or back traveling back and forth to different places. Or maybe you're still working from home. But wherever you are or wherever you went, I hope you had a fruitful day. And um, it's a joy to be able to come back to you this evening so that we can get into studying the Word of God. Now, this, we have, I have a situation, I should say, <laughs> where we have finished our Bible study on, on healing. We finished that last, uh, last week on, on the subject of divine healing. We looked at different aspects of it, those of you who were studying with us. And um, I wanted to step into or start a new Bible study um, maybe I should just mention it to tickle uh, some of you. On the end times, I have been uh, looking at a number of things to do with the end times, and I wanted to do a study on the end times, looking at different things, dispensations, looking at the rapture, looking at, at what the temple, what we call the temple discourse, what Jesus shared about the end times when he came out of the temple and the disciples were saying to him, Lord, look at the temple. They're trying to say, look at how beautiful it is. And Jesus was literally telling them that they shouldn't look at these natural things. And <clears throat> from that, he began to talk about the end times. And I wanted to start that, but uh, um, I kind of changed my mind because I have this Thursday and next Thursday um, open to Bible study. And then afterwards, we're going to get into our different Christmas, um, you know, uh, carols, nights. And uh, then we have uh, uh, the 24th night service and then the 31st night service. So obviously I, when that happens, I come off whatever subject I am teaching on. And I felt that if I started teaching on uh, the end times, it will just be too short to cut it off. And then that will take us all the way into the new year. So what I'll do, um, I've decided to do is to hold off until the new year you know, before we get into, so just, um, you know, uh, coming attractions, like they normally say it. So in the new year, as God leads us into the new year, we will begin to study on the end times. Okay, very important. I want to put a whole bunch of things into perspective at the beginning of the COVID season, or not, let me not call it COVID season, but at the beginning of the lockdowns in, the, in March when uh, the COVID was, was beginning to just uh, uh, affect a whole bunch of peoples, we began to hear a whole bunch of different prophecies. Some people say it was because we're moving into 5G, I almost said G5, but 5G, and people started coming up with all kinds of prophetic stuff. And a part of me was tempted to start to teach on end times to sort of uh, to say to people, go back to the word of God, see what the word of God says. But on the other hand, I just felt, just be still and let's, let's ride this wave and, and through it and let people themselves begin to see that that is not what the scriptures are saying. And I think now people are recognizing that um, some of the pro pro so-called prophecies that were given were not, or is not really of God. It was not nothing to do with the five G and other things that were said about it. So I just felt right this storm and then come to a place where now you can, um, because people were very distracted about so many things, and I felt that this is a good time now to teach on the end times. Um, for some of you to be a reminder, for some people to be brand new. But one of the things is that God, you must understand, is that as a child of God, God has got you. 
Amen. He said he will never leave us nor forsake us. He has got us. Amen. And it's so important that you rest in the confidence that God's word is true. God will never change his mind about what he has spoken and we can rest and be assured in it so that we can continue to fulfill those things that he has called us to, not troubled about our eternity, because once you have given your life to Jesus, then your eternity is in his hands. Praise the Lord. Well, so tonight, what I have decided to do is to take us through certain key things, some things I studied in the book of Acts that I believe that will be a blessing to you. It will um, remind us of some things in our lives and um, um, prophetically, some things that I believe God has been speaking to the church, which will draw our attention um, to these things that we'll begin to talk about. So before we get into, um, before we get into it, um, let's pray, and then we can study together these uh, wonderful things from the Word of God. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and we give you praise. We thank you for a night like this where we can come together and study your word and knowing that by the study of your word, Jesus will be revealed to us in ways that maybe we have not seen him. Father, we pray today, committing this time into your very holy hands that will be led by your spirit and that revelation will come by the Holy Spirit even as we delve into the word of God, that will, hearts will be challenged, will be inspired, that there'll they will, they will be a stirring up of our hearts, O oh Father, to continue to seek you, Jesus, and your word. And Father, for this, we give you thanks. We give you praise. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. And everyone said, amen and amen. Forgive me, I forgot to say to you, ask you to, you know, normally I say to you, get, you know, text your friends, text your families, remind them of, of our time of study so that we can study the word of God together. A few years ago, I was studying the book of Acts, um, just a couple of years ago, uh, years back or so, and God spoke to me very strongly, I believe, that, you know, sometimes you read in the scriptures and certain things stand out to you in some very special ways. And God really spoke to me strongly out of the book of Acts chapter 3 and Acts chapter 4. And what I believe he was saying to me was very prophetic. And it's like he gave me glimpses of what is happening in his church or what is going to be happening in his church. And I am, you know, um, and, and it's like how we have to be in, in the know so that we can be in the flow, like somebody said. Because when you're in the know, then you can flow with what God is doing because God is still working in and through his church to fulfill his purposes. And so we have to be aligned to the spirit of God, to God, um, um, to to fulfill the things that he wants to fulfill because he's going to do that through the church. He's not just going to do it arbitrarily. He's going to do it through his church because the church of the Lord Jesus Christ is the body of Christ in the earth. And so through the church, he will fulfill his purposes and bring things back to his glory and his honor. So I was studying the book of, like I said, book of Acts and chapters three and four is what we're going to be looking at in the next two weeks, there's some very powerful things there that I believe will be a blessing to you. So turn with me to the book of Acts and chapter number three, Acts and chapter number three. Now, what you have to understand is in Acts chapter one, we see Jesus is risen from, from the dead and he has come um, he is met with his disciples. When you look in the book of the gospel of John, you see where he meets at the closing chapters of the book of John. He meets with his disciples, and that's where he has encounters with, 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 with Thomas and some of his disciples. And Thomas was one of them who said, unless I see, you know, when they said Jesus had risen from the dead, he says, unless I see the 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 marks on his hands, and, and I will never believe. And so when Jesus showed up, Jesus was not there at that time, but Jesus, you know, is God. 
and he was all knowing and he showed up and this time in his resurrected body and he said to Thomas, because you have not seen, you did not believe. So he showed him his hands and so he says, see my hands, you know, and my feet and my sides that that is where I was pierced and I was nailed to the cross. And he says that now you have seen, you have believed, but blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. And that's what God wants us to be. We have to take his word and believe his word. And by believing his word, we will see the manifestation. You know, some people say believing or seeing is believing, but you want to question that when you see something, you don't believe it, you know that it's there. But when you have not seen it and you have, you're looking at it in the word of God and you say, well, if God has said it, then I believe it, even though I don't physically see it. Then Jesus said that if you act that way, you are blessed. Why? Because you are acting in line with how heaven governs, governs things. It's by looking at his word, accepting his word, believing what his word said, and then the manifestation of his word comes out of that. Praise the Lord. Anyway, we get into the book of Acts, chapter one, and he, you know, gives his final orders to, to, to um, his disciples that they should go and tarry, you know, in, in, in Jerusalem. Um, and he talked about how they will receive power from on high and power to reach into Jerusalem, Judea, um, and Samaria, and onto the uttermost parts of the world. And it's so interesting in the book of Acts, or oh, the whole book of Acts follows that pro process because in the, the power of God falls upon, upon the disciples um, in the upper room in Acts chapter 2 in Jerusalem. And the power of God affects all these people who had come to Jerusalem to worship and, you know, the moment Peter finished preaching, 3,000 uh, souls were added to the church instantly. You know, can you imagine that you start a church and, and within days you have 3,000 new converts? I'm not talking about mature believers, 3,000 new converts, you know, encountering God. And, you know, we, the church of the living God, must start to believe for these mighty signs and wonders where people's hearts, you know, they will be, will be drawn to the things of God and that there will be conversions into the kingdom of God through the preaching of the word of God like we've never seen before. God did it you know, at the beginning of the church and the church is still around, God is still around and these things are not past God. They are not passed away. We have to seek after God to see his power and his presence move in our times as well. Praise the Lord. But all these people are saying, and the church begins in, in power, in authority, and a whole bunch of things begin to happen. People are getting saved, people are getting healed, um, you know, um, and that is the onset of the Church of the Living God. The disciples are baptized, so people are filled with the Holy Spirit, and, and the Church of the Living God starts in power. That's how the Church of the Living God began, in the power of Almighty God. And that's what we see in the first two chapters of, of the book of Acts. So when I got to chapter 3, like I was saying, in my study, in the, uh, um, that's when I believe God began to speak to me. I'd, I've read the book of Acts um, on different, I don't know how many times, but it's a book that I've read on, on several occasions. But, but God began to, I believe, really speak to me through these chapters, chapters three and, and four. There are other things that he spoke to me about, but these rose up to me very prophetically. So I'm just going to take my time and go through the different things. There are five things, um, six things that I believe the Spirit of God showed me concerning his church. Okay, and um, let me begin with verse number one. He says, uh, that is Acts chapter three, verse number one, if you tend uh, with me to that scripture. It says, now Peter and John went up together to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. And 
the first thing I want to share with you is the fact that prayer must be paramount in our lives as believers. That's what the Spirit of God showed me. Prayer must be paramount in our lives, must be the first thing he started talking about this is in as individuals and corporately as the church, we have to begin to step up as far as prayer is concerned. All right. He says, now they went up. Now notice what he said. They went up to prayer. You know, when you start to prayer, you go up. Hallelujah. You go up. When I say you go up, not physically, yes, they were maybe headed, maybe where they were headed were, was uptown, which maybe they were headed uptown to the temple. That's why they called it up. But in the spirit, God is, is revealing to us that when we, when we get into prayer and we begin to seek God, what happens is we begin to go up, spiritually speaking. We begin to go up. We begin to elevate ourselves beyond the natural to the supernatural. Okay, so prayer must be paramount. In the book of Luke and chapter number 18, if you turn to or you write this down, Luke and chapter number 18, verse 1, Jesus said, then he spoke a parable to them that men always, always ought to pray and not lose heart or faint or be discouraged or give up. He says men always ought to pray. And when he's talking about men, he's talking about us believers, okay, because it is, it is our prayer that he listens to, okay. We are today the sons and daughters of the Most High God. And so prayer is very, very key, very important, must be very important in our lives. We must not sideline prayer at all. We must not uh, back down from our prayer lives. It's so important that we are giving ourselves consistently to prayer. I read um, Acts chapter 3 again. Now Peter and John went up together to the temple at the hour of prayer, okay, which was the ninth hour. Now, I remember a couple of weeks ago, I got a, somebody asked the question, when, um, because I, I use this teaching or this scripture in talking about uh, 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 in the area of divine healing. So somebody asked me, is there a particular time of prayer? Not, not necessarily, but one thing that this tells me is that these guys had a scheduled time that they went up to pray. They, 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 it was very important that they went up in the time of prayer to pray. And you and I, you know, having set a set time of prayer is important. Now we must be praying all the time. It's good to be praying all the time. You know, sometimes, you know, you are walking, uh, uh, you know, like these days, I walk a lot with Jane and, and because I'm with her, we talk, but sometimes, you know, she will be, you know, praying and I'll be praying, just praying the spirit, even as we walk uh, we, and we stop to talk. We don't stop, but we, we stop praying and we talk a while about different things. And some, you know, and normally I'm with the dog and so she's ahead. And uh, because of where we walk, I have to control the dog and stuff like that. So, but then we just, we just get praying. Sometimes she's ahead of me praying. Sometimes I'm behind praying. Um, but we, prayer must be a part of our lives. Amen. When you go back into the book of Acts, the Bible tells us from Acts chapter 2, I beg your pardon, um, Acts chapter 2, we are in the book of Acts, but Acts chapter 2 verse 1, he says, and when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place, and suddenly there's, there came a sound from heaven, you know, as of a um, rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared um, appeared to them divided tongues as of fire. So fire settled on their heads and, and one sat upon each of them. This is the 120 who were in the upper room. Then the Bible says, and they were all filled with the Spirit, Holy Spirit, and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. This is the onset. This is the birthing of the church. And when the church was birthed, you know, up to this point, there was no church. Okay, Jesus had mentioned it. He said, I will build my church 
and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. This is when, 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 when Peter, Jesus asked Peter, who do you say I am? He says, he said, who do men say that I am? And they said, some said, so you are a prophet. Some say you are such and such. But he says, who do you say I, the son of man, am? And, G and Peter said, you are the Christ or the anointed one. Hallelujah. You are Messiah. That word Messiah in the Hebrew speaks about the anointed one, Christ. You know, obviously in the Old Testament, you didn't have the name Christ. When he, he, he in the new, we see Jesus Christ. But, but, but Peter referred, he said, you are Christ, the anointed one and his anointing. That's what the name Christ means. Messiah, you are Christ. And Jesus said, uh, uh, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. He got this by revelation. Then he says, upon this, I will build my church. He said to him, Peter, you, you are, he, he referred to Peter that you are a little rock. You are a chip of the old block, like they say. And upon this rock, Upon what rock? Upon the rock of revelation knowledge. How you received from heaven, that is how I'm going to build my church. My church is going to be built on revelation knowledge of the word of God. And so here they were in the upper room praying, and the, the church is birthed with prayer. Watch this. They were praying, and there, were, and there came a mighty win and they were filled with the holy spirit and they began to speak in tongues and they be, god gave them their prayer language okay and he had already told them jesus had already told them that they should tarry in jerusalem or wait in jerusalem and let me just explain that you know because there came a time where people used to do these waiting meetings because they were waiting for the holy spirit no that was a specific instruction to the 120 to those disciples that go wait until don't make a move until you are endued with power from on high and as they waited on god God, the Spirit of God moved, and that's what we call the day of Pentecost, where the Spirit of God, before, even though the Holy Spirit was in the earth, the Holy Spirit came upon the prophets, came upon the office of the priest, was upon the office of the king, you know, to function in the areas that God had called them to. The Holy Spirit never came, was not indwelling anybody, because they were not born again. But by Jesus being raised from the dead, that means now now the Holy Spirit could come and dwell inside man and, and, and we see the manifestation of the Spirit of God. This is what we call the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So every believer, every believer, anybody who has received Jesus Christ as your Lord and personal Savior has the Spirit of God in him. But then there is also the promise of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That's why Jesus said, tarry. Tarry in Jerusalem, that is Acts chapter 1, until you receive endowment, you know, until you receive power from on high. And that is what we see happening in Acts chapter 2 and verse 4 says, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. I like to say this, this other tongues is speaking about their prayer language. Some people mix it up with the gifts of the Holy Spirit. This is not the gifts of the Holy Spirit in operation because some, some people try to say, well, it was the gift of tongues that was operating in this particular situation. No, all of them received the baptism of the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues. And I like to call this our prayer language. But what you have to understand is that it's not just about having a prayer language. This is power, hallelujah. This is power. And we see here that the Bible tells us, let's go to Acts, go back to Acts chapter 3. The Bible says that they, they were going to the place of prayer. They were going to pray in the hour of prayer. And, 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 and it was the ninth hour. And the Bible tells us that, that something happened. But before we get to what happened, I want you to see a couple of, couple of things here. When we pray, you know, still in the book of Acts, when we pray, you know, we release the power of God. Let's go into some, some wonderful things happen when, when we commit ourselves to pray. Let's look at an example in 
chapter 12. So come with me to Acts chapter 12. Acts chapter 12, and we will start reading from verse 5. But in Acts chapter 12, um, the Bible tells us over there in verses 1 to about 4 that Herod had, the king Herod had stretched out his hands and was harassing the people from, from the church. And then he killed James, all right, the brother of John with a sword. He killed him. And verse 3 says, and because he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to seize Peter also. Now it was during the days of unleavened bread. So when he had arrested him and put him in prison and delivered him to four squads of soldiers to keep him intending uh, to bring him before the people after the Passover. So his plan, he had killed um, James, like we say, the brother of, of, of John. And now he was his plan was to to kill Peter, but he could not do that because they had the Passover season. And so he didn't want to do it as to transgress the, the law in that sense. So his plan was that after the Passover, he was going to bring him before the people. And obviously that will be judgment on Peter and also kill Peter. His intention was to quell the move of God, to stop the church of the living God. And listen, the church of the living God cannot be stopped. It cannot be stopped. They may stop individuals who are believers and Christians. Even people have been, we see when you get into, by the time we get into Acts chapter number seven, where we see Stephen moving powerfully by the power of God, he is stoned to death. He is martyred. But do you know what? From that time, the gospel spread. You know, like I said to you, Jesus said that they will receive power after the Holy Ghost is come upon them and there'll be witnesses to him in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the world. And if you study the word of God, if you study the book of Acts carefully, you see it has that process. It started in Jerusalem, like I'm talking about. That's where we received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And then it moved to Judea. And then it moved to Samaria because when it got to Samaria, that is where you see Philip. You know, Philip went to Samaria. The Bible says in chapter 8, he began to preach. And the whole city, a revival broke in the city of Samaria. Amazing. You know, it broke as people received Christ. And then he called for the apostles that they should come because there is something happening here. People are being healed. People are being set free. Even Simon, who was the chief occultist or, uh, there, you know, sorcerer in the city, received Christ from what the scriptures tell us. And I mean, he bewitched people in the city, but the power of God you know, was affecting this place through this man's ministry. And that was after Stephen was martyred. So they thought by getting rid of Stephen, they thought they could stop the gospel. They could stop the church of the living God. Well, I have news for you. You may stop a man, but you cannot stop God. There is no way you can stop God. Just about when you think you have stopped God, he'll be functioning someplace else in a more powerful way. The church of the living God is here to stay in terms of in this agenda to fulfill the purposes of Almighty God. Hallelujah. That is even, I mean, whoo. This is getting me preaching, praise the Lord. Anyway, let me back up. And um, we see here that in the book of Acts, uh, we are in chapter number 12. Let's see some things about prayer. So here they have captured Peter. I want you to notice that. Put him in prison with four squads of, of, of soldiers guarding him. That's quite a few soldiers, you know, and he's in chains. And he's asleep. Anytime I read this, it gives me a picture of believers. If it was another believer in this situation, you will be quaking in your boots, knowing you're going to die very soon. But the Bible says, Peter, verse 5, Peter was there before, therefore, I beg your pardon, was therefore kept in prison by constant, sorry, kept in prison, but, I beg your pardon, but, Constant prayer was offered to God for him by the church. That the Amplified says that, but fervent prayer for him 
was persistently made to God by the church or by the assembly. And that's what we have to be doing. We consist, we have to have as individuals, we have to be consistently praying. As the church of the living God, we have to also be consistently praying. Pray. Now watch this. He says that constant prayer was offered to God for him. It's a type of prayer. There are different types of prayer, okay? And this is what we call the prayer of intercession. The prayer of intercession is where you pray in behalf of another, all right? So they were interceding in behalf of Peter, interceding for his release, interceding to, 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 to stop the plan of, of, of the enemy, that is to stop Herod from executing Peter and were interceding for him. And the Bible says, and when Herod was about to bring him out, that, that night, or was about to bring him out, that night, Peter was sleeping, bound with two chains between two soldiers. And the guards before the door were keeping the prison. So this guy is what called, he was heavily guarded, all right? Heavily guarded. In other words, there was in the natural, there was no way that, that you were going to break through this. You know, when, when this, this reminds me about when Jesus was crucified, the Pharisees and scribes and all these people went to these these. Uh, Pharisees and religious leaders went to, to Pilate and said to Pilate that, listen, this joker, speaking of Jesus, they said this joker used to say things like, you know, he will, he will be crucified, he will die, and, and after three days he will rise from the dead, and we've, he's dead now, he's been put in a tomb, but, but the, his disciples may just decide to forgive me, uh, the phone is going. I better turn this off before we get in trouble. <laughs> you know, um, sorry about that. Your call can't be taken at the moment, <laughs> so please this leave is, your message after the turn. This is my landline. I don't know how it just took off like that. Anyway, um, hello. Oh, that's Please forgive me. Oh, Let me just. <laughs> okay, We're in trouble yeah, here. Yeah. My landline hardly goes, but suddenly it just went. <laughs> Never experienced this before. I normally switch my mobile phone off because most people call me on my mobile phone. So my mobile phone is on silent. And then suddenly, guess what? Is my landline that is 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 going and I'm in trouble trying to disengage it. Anyway, apologies for for uh for that. But like I was saying, they 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 came to um Herod, sorry, I beg your pardon, Pontius Pilate and said to him that his disciples may come and steal his body, and then they will start to broadcast that Jesus rose from the dead. And um and that will even make the case even worse because if people now start to see that sort of he rose from the dead, it will be another a whole bunch of another issue to deal with. So he said that can you send special guards? So a special guard was sent to 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 the tomb. The tomb was sealed, and a special guard was put in control to guard it so that the disciples couldn't come. But the Bible says there was a visitation of angels. And when those, when the angels of God showed up, the, the God, the Bible says the angels, the, the, the God were like lifeless. They just fell under the power of God and were lifeless. And Jesus, you know, came out of the tomb. tomb. There's a song that is played concerning, somebody wrote a song. It says the stone was rolled away. It was supernaturally rolled away so that Christ will resurrect victoriously. And that is exactly what happened. Jesus rose from the dead and he ever lived and he's seated on the right hand of majesty. And the book of Hebrews tells us that he's making intercession for the saints. Praise the Lord forevermore. You cannot stop the move of God. It is impossible because the power of God far supersedes any kind of governments. Governments have tried to do it going way back historically, 
government has tried to do it. They thought they could stop the church of the living God, but the church of the living God continues to go on because God continues to place his spirit in people whose hearts are open to him. Praise the Lord. So anyway, that is what we see here. Where Herod is thought that by killing Peter, or by killing James and killing Peter, so he's on that agenda. Obviously, Peter is in prison, he's asleep. And the Bible says, and now behold, an angel of the Lord stood by him. That is by Peter. And a light shone in the prison. And, this, and he, that is the angel, struck Peter on the side. I mean, the guy was so fast asleep, resting in God. On, and, and raised him up saying, arise quickly. And his chains fell off his hands. Amazing. I'm gonna read through it and then we're gonna come back. Then the angel said to him, get yourself and tie on your sandals. And, and so he did. And he said to him, put on your garment and follow me. So he went out and followed him and did not know that what was done by the angel was real, but thought he was seeing a vision. When they were past the first and the second guard post, they came to the iron gates that leads to the city. That means the last final gate. You know, sometimes when you watch some of these documentaries or, you know, films or about prison, you notice that when a prisoner is released, apart from maybe him coming out of his cell and coming through uh, the corridors of the prison, you see that his, his loved ones or whoever is picking him up, that is if he has somebody to pick him up, will be standing outside the main prison gates. And then finally, uh, sometimes either the whole prison gate is open or a part of the gate is open so that that prisoner comes out of that because he has been set free. So think about it. The main prison gates, even up to today, when you see a prison gate, it's no flimsy gate. It's a solid gate. And you see here, the Bible says that they came to the iron gate that leads to the city. I want you to make a note of this because uh, you're gonna see the power of prayer, which opened to them of its own accord. The gates opened of its own accord. You think that Tesco is the first one that got automatic gates? There it is. The power of God opened the gates of, of its own accord. And the Bible says, and they went out and went down one street and immediately the angel departed from him. Verse 11 says, and when Peter had come to himself, he said, now I know for certain that the Lord has sent his angel and has delivered me from the hand of Herod and from all the expectations of the Jewish people. Now, I want to point some things out to you. Get your pen or, or type these things out. Listen, he says that if, he says that, he says that constant prayer. See, when there's constant prayer going on in your life, as an individual or corporately as a church of the living God. But when constant prayer is going on, this is a picture the Bible gives us of the things that begin to happen when constant prayer is going on. There comes a supernatural release. I beg your pardon. The first thing is, a, uh, is angelic interventions. Angelic interventions. Now, Now, pay attention here. Watch this. The Bible doesn't say we should pray to angels. They didn't pray to angels. All they did was to a consistent prayer was being done in behalf of Peter. So they were just praying that Peter will be released, that Peter will be delivered. And they were praying and interceding for, uh, 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 for Peter. But the, we see an angel of the Lord show up. And folks, this is in the New Testament. Sometimes people think that angelic activity was only in the Old Testament. No, 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 no. And there is more angelic activity in the New Testament than in the Old Testament. When you study the scriptures carefully, in the book of, of Hebrews, the Bible talks us that we have come, I believe it's Hebrews chapter uh, 
um, I believe it's Hebrews chapter, I just had it in mind, but in the book of Hebrews, it says we have come to the, to the church of the living God and to a myriad of angels. I, 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 I get it in Hebrews chapter 12, uh, it's Hebrews chapter number 12 and verse 12. In fact, let's go there quickly or write it down, Hebrews chapter number 12, because I love for you to, this is Bible study, by the way, um, for you to go check these scriptures out. And verse number 22, Hebrews chapter uh, 12, verse 22, if I'm right, it says, but you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels. When he says you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, he's talking about the church of the living God, the church. Hallelujah. It, this is in this time. Verse 23, to the general assembly, there it is, and the church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven, to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of just men made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel. So notice what he says here. We have come to, to, to the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, an innumerable company of angels. So, so angelic ministry is, is, you know, angels are supernatural beings. There are several scriptures. We are not studying about angels, but there are several scriptures. The Bible says even, even we're talking about hospitality. You know, the Bible challenges believers to be hospitable to the point where he says that some have entertained angels just by the heart and having a heart of hospitality. Hallelujah. And so we see here angelic, you know, intervention when constant prayer is being made. The second thing that we see here is a supernatural release from bondage. Have you noticed that the Bible says that when the angel smote him, the chains fell off? You know, when we are praying consistently and fervently, guess what happens? There comes a supernatural, supernatural breakthroughs. What happened? Chains and things that hinder us um, are, are, are broken. We are released from the hindrances. You see, the chain, the chains, you know, not only did they have the soldiers, not only were they, was he behind prison bars, but he was also held by chains. In other words, if you were going to be able to send a whole bunch of people to get to him, you had to deal with all that plus the fact that he was also in chains. And the Bible says that the chains just fell off supernaturally. <laughs> then the angel said to, to him, you know, put your clothes on, you know, put your shoes on. And then he said to him, follow me, praise the Lord. When there is consistent prayer being made, guess what happens? There is supernatural guidance. Hallelujah. There comes supernatural guidance and instruction by the Spirit of God. God leads. God directs. When the consistent prayer is being made, the voice of God becomes, we become more attentive to the voice of God. Because, you see, we become more sensitive to the Spirit than to natural things. Or, or, or we are tuning ourselves more to the spirit. So there was supernatural direction. Are you seeing that? Angelic in, in, intervention, um, 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 supernatural release from, from bondage and hindrances that the enemy sort of is placing in, 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 in our way. And then there's also supernatural guidance, you know, um, and instruction. Another thing we realize here is also there's deliverance from all kinds of opposition. Notice that they had to go through different doors, you know, and doors can speak of two things. Doors can speak of openings into, into, into the goodness of God, openings into the favor of God. But at the same time, doors and gates also can be speak of opposition that is standing in your way. In this particular case, these prison doors were not doors of opportunity. They were doors that were standing in the way of this man's release. And they, as they went, the doors began to open. They went through different um, prison doors. And finally, they came 
to the main prison door that opened automatically. And that also tells us that doors of opportunity open to us supernaturally. That same door that was a gate of hindering him from getting into his liberty and freedom, the Bible says it opened supernaturally to him. What does that tell us? Consistent prayer opens doors of opportunity, you know, supernaturally to us. Praise the Lord. The other thing that happens is this, because by the next day, what, when they went to try to find him, he was not there. One of the things that supernatural or consistent prayer does is it disappoints the expectations of our, the enemy. Amen. It disappoints the expectation. What was the expectation of Herod and the expectation of the Jewish people? The scripture says that he was, you know, the next day he was going to pull him out. And it, verse, if we go to verse number 11 of chapter number 12, the scripture says over there, and Peter came, had, and, when, and, when, and when Peter had come to himself, he said, now I know for certain that the Lord has sent his angel and delivered me from the hand of Herod and from the expectations of the Jewish people. Hallelujah. Now, I know that it was Herod who was the, 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 the agent or and these Jewish people who were expecting Peter to die, but Peter's problem was not the Jewish people. And your problem is not people. The Bible says we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. The Bible says our warfare is, 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 is in the realm of the spirit. Satan is ultimately our enemy. That's what you have to understand. Satan and his cohorts, they are ultimately the enemy that we're dealing with. Because sometimes what happens is that even though, the, even not, it's not sometimes, but the enemy has to use vessels. He has to use people like God will use people to do, fulfill his work. God doesn't just do his work in the earth. He uses people. And Satan also wants to use people to do and fulfill his purposes on the earth. But this is the trick, is that we must be careful as children of God, even though somebody is being used of Satan, we don't have the right to hate that person. Because sometimes the way the word of God is even taught from pulpits, it, 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 it stirs up, you know, it stirs, stirs up the flesh of the believer against the unbeliever or against somebody who is out to do evil against another person. But we don't have the luxury as believers to do that. We are supposed to love people anyway. So, so you have to be careful. The enemy we are talking about here is Satan. Ultimately, it is Satan. Satan may use people and try to, to um, use people to fulfill the things that he wants to fulfill in this earth, just like God wants to use you and is using you to fulfill his purposes on the earth. I hope you got those things down. Let me quickly go through them. There's angelic um, intervention when consistent prayer is going forward. There is supernatural release from bondage. Then there is supernatural guidance. There's deliverance from opposition. And then doors of opportunity open supernaturally. And there's a disappointment of the expectations of the enemy. Guess what? There's one thing that I found very fascinating. The Bible says when the angel showed up and a bright light shone, in the prison. So obviously that it was dark, bright light, you know, supernaturally it was a bright light in the place. Guess what? He told Peter, put on your clothes, put on your shoes and tie your laces. Have you noticed he didn't do that for Peter? Because God will not do for you what you can do for yourself naturally. Okay, God will not do for us what we can naturally do for ourselves. Amen. So that tells you that there are things that we have to do when we are praying, we're seeking God about something. For example, if we is a job, God is not going to write the application for you. 
you have to write that job application. You have to fill in all the details. You have to go for the interview. You know, I'm just using seeking a job as an, as, as an example. It, it's not gonna happen if you just sit down and, um, and, and twiddle your thumbs. You've got to get up and go, you know, and, and, and fulfill the natural things. And then God, you see, because this is where God comes in. When they tell you that, do you know how many people have applied for that job? But you know, you go in the name of the Lord. And these are the things that consistent prayer releases in our lives. Praise the Lord. Let's go back to Acts chapter number three. Acts chapter number three. So the first thing I've been talking about is prayer. There's so much more I could talk about prayer, but in, in this context, I just want us to see these different things I wanna share with you. Um, prayer, prayer must be paramount. The first thing is prayer. And the Bible says in verse two, and a certain man was lame from his mother's womb, who was carried and laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called beautiful, to ask alms from those who entered the temple, who seeing Peter and John come uh, about to go into the temple, ask for alms. And fixing his eyes on him with, with John, Peter said, look at us. So he gave them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. Then Peter said, silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Rise up and walk, and verse 7 says, and he took him by the hand, by the right hand, and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. So leaping up, he stood and walked and entered the temple uh, with them and leaping, uh, walking, leaping and praising God. Hallelujah. So watch this. They, they, they are on the way to the temple. They get to the temple. Obviously, they were going to pray. And I said, prayer is the first thing that I wanted to point out to you. The next thing I want to point out to you is this. When prayer is going forth, we've already seen it in those verses that are, I just give to you in the book of Acts chapter 12. When prayer starts to go forth, there comes a release of power. There comes a release of power. So you see this man is crippled and the Bible says they make that command. They see this man crippled from his, this man has been crippled his whole life. He's been sitting down at, 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 um, uh, at the temple gate uh, called beautiful, the, the gate called beautiful and you know, I have not studied this fully, but I have heard people talk about it. Um, I've read around it before, but if you think about it, they said Jesus came around there, and this was just after Jesus rose from the dead. So this man who had been sitting there, because this had not been more than, uh, you know, Jesus had, had gone to heaven in that sense, um, and this is chapter number three. So this couldn't have been more than six months since Jesus rose from the dead. It couldn't be more than a year. Even if you say even a year, this man had been sitting there all his life. So Jesus must have walked past there. And it makes, it makes sense in that, in that matter, for that matter. But nevertheless, the disciples show up and this man is begging for arms and they command this man to rise up in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And one thing I love is this, they stretch their hand and they pick this man up. So when they gave the command, this man was still sitting down, he was still in the crippled state and they grabbed this man's hand and they raised him up. And the Bible says his ankle bones received strength and he began to walk, he began to leap and he began to praise the Lord. One thing I want to bring to your attention is that when prayer is going forth consistently, there comes a release of the power of God in our lives and also in the settings in which we, we function. If it is a church that is giving itself to prayer and is, or a family that is giving itself to prayer or an individual consistently giving yourself to prayer, there comes a release of the power of God in your life. That is what we see here. Prayer leads to the release of the power of God in different areas of our lives. Turn with me into the book of James. The book of James and chapter number five. 
And let's go to verse number 16. It says, confess your faults one to another that you may be healed. Pray for one another that you may, I beg your pardon, uh, confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. Then he says, the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. The Amplified Bible says, confess to one another, therefore your faults, your slips, your false steps, your offenses, and your sins. Now, that is not what I want to concentrate on. I don't want to take time discussing that mainly, but, but concentrate on the B part. It says, and pray also for one another that, that you may be healed and restored to a spiritual tone of mind and heart. Then he says that the earnest, heartfelt, continued prayer of a righteous man makes tremendous power available, dynamic in its working. Notice that I said, or the scripture said from the beginning, they went up to prayer. So you see, going to prayer is like going vertically, okay? You go vertically. Now notice this, God is not up here. God is everywhere. Because sometimes when we say God is up here, for, you forget that somebody, we, uh, I'm the UK saying God is up here, all right? Then somebody also on the other side of the earth also says that God is up. And if we look at the globe, we could all be pointing in different directions when we say God is up. Basically, God is everywhere, all right? The Bible says he dwells in us. All right, the fullness of the Godhead body. God is, is everywhere. We, you know, for if we compare God and the Spirit to us, we are a very small part of His creation. <laughs> you know, if you watch um, sometimes when they beam things from space onto the earth, sometimes you can't believe how how earth becomes like just a smaller part of when it comes to space, we are a very small part. Now, if this is into the natural human eye, think about God who created the whole universe, you know? So, so watch this. The Bible says here, when prayer is made, he says the effect, effective, fervent prayer of the righteous man makes tremendous power available, dynamic. See, dy the, here we are here, okay? We are in the horizontal. So when we go up to prayer vertically, all right, we go up to prayer in that sense because we go up to a higher being. His name is God. Uh, the, the, the psalmist said, take me to the rock that is higher than me, okay? In other words, I go to a higher level when I, I am praying. And then the effect of my prayer happens dynamically. It begins because this is where my problems are. My problems are not in, in, in heaven. My problems are on earth. The opposition is on earth. And so when we pray, we release the power of God. We release the power of God. It says the fervent, heartfelt, I like this, the earnest, heartfelt, continued prayer of a righteous man makes tremendous power. That is how the Amplified puts it. I love this. It says makes tremendous power available dynamic in its working, hallelujah. So number one, we must give ourselves to prayer. Amen, I just wanna encourage you concerning your prayer life. Amen, don't, don't give up, don't throw in the towel. The Bible says men ought to pray and not give up. When men talking about us believers ought to pray, pray and it will lead to power in different manifestations of the power of God in different areas of our life. We, some of us are going through stuff, dealing with stuff in our lives that trust me, what you need is to see the power of God move in that situation to turn it around for your glory, for the glory of almighty God. So prayer is going to release the power of God in dimensions we have not even seen before if we will give us, so that moves us into the area of prayer. We see how this man was raised by the power of God. This man has sat there all his life, you know, and that was another thing, or the second thing I saw in those scriptures. Now, I'm gonna stop right here. Next week, we'll get into the next thing 
that we see in these chapters. So we are dealing with Acts chapter number three and Acts chapter number four. Just some real uh, nuggets, or we can call it prophetic nuggets. You can, you know, that God pointed out to me um, a, a number of years ago, just a couple of years ago, if I'm right, concerning what will begin to happen in his church as his church gives him themselves or um, to prayer and we will see begin to see the power of God move in different areas of our life praise the Lord I trust that this has been a blessing uh, to you we'll pick it up from here next week we'll pick up from where we we, we look, we've got four more things to go. I thought I could cover three, um, <clears throat> but we've just covered two. And so um, <clears throat> next week we'll try to cover all the rest of the four. And um, obviously that will become a good place of study for you. Again, uh, trust that the word of God has been encouraging and a blessing to you this evening. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. God is a good God. Well, that brings us to the conclusion of today, but, or I'll say of our study today, but just a few reminders, a few reminders um, for our, our family, church family. But before we do these reminders, I want to give you an opportunity to give and sow your seed into the kingdom of God. The Bible says that it is more blessed to give than to receive. That is what the Bible says. Sometimes, People quote that scripture and say it is better to give than to receive. And I understand what they're saying, but that is a natural way of saying it because the truth of the matter is that if you give, if you have, if you have 20 pounds and you give 10 pounds away, you are worse off in the natural than, than when you had your 20 pounds. But in the spirit, if you gave it, if you sowed that seed, if you sowed it as a seed into the gospel, or you sowed it as an offering, then what you have just done is that you've tapped into the supernatural. You've tapped into the spiritual. That's where the Bible says that you, it is more blessed. It uses the word blessed. Blessed means that you are empowered to prosper by sowing that seed into, in, as an offering, into the kingdom of almighty God. So God richly bless you as you give uh, this evening um, on your screens, I'm sure on your text um, area, you have the information on how to give into this house, into this ministry. Um, you have our uh, bank details, and then you also have all our, <clears throat> um, you can go onto the website, the link, use the link. You can just, just use the link um, and the give button over there and um, you, you, you can give that way as well. So God richly bless you as you give. We really appreciate your gifts of love, your tithes, your offerings, your gifts of faith that you consistently bring into the house of God. And it is through your consistent and faithful giving that we can continue to do the work that God has called us to do. And God richly bless you for your giving tonight. Amen and amen. Praise the Lord. All right. Okay. I'm going to go through a few um a few um, announcements, and then we can then go and look at what questions we have for tonight. Um, let's see. Well, by way of announcements, that is for our uh, PCC family, by way of announcements, we just reminding you of, just a moment, I want to get, um, there we go. Yeah, by way of announcements, um, we have um, on 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 Friday um, evening we have um, our TIC group meeting, and so TIC Teens in Christ, you are reminded about Friday um, your session on Friday. Don't miss out on that. It's very important that you get to, you continue to get together obviously through Zoom and do your studies and uh, your sessions together. Then on Saturday morning at 10 a.m., I believe that's the right time, 10 a.m., there's a 
the last ladies coffee morning for the year all right not forever it's just for the year so for, uh sun saturday saturday the fifth i'm just looking at my my my, my diary over there saturday the fifth of in the morning we have the the ladies coffee morning so ladies i believe you have to register um, um go on to this website and then register um, and you'll be given a login um you know for the meeting on for your meeting on saturday and don't miss this time together i believe it's going to be a time of praise a time of worship time of encouraging a time of prayer and you know i know when ladies get together to pray stuff happens so just want to encourage you about that and remind you about that so ladies get the word out tell other ladies in the in the church um and remind them about you know out your time together on saturday then in the evening something special is happening we have the northwest zone northwest zone that is our ofn our oasis family network northwest zone we have an evening of fellowship together all right an evening fellowship together and i'll be joining you with jane pastor jane and i'll be joining you for this evening fellowship that will be at 7 7 p.m so get that word around i know that you some of you have already received notices you have to go on the website and and also register for that you can go and the link is there you can register for it and you so that you can join the zoom session but this is for our ofn northwest zone that is at 7 p.m on saturday then on sunday there are going to be quite a few things on sunday 11 o'clock in the morning obviously we have our, our live streaming service our church service will be at 7 sorry at 11 a.m as usual but at 5 p.m and uh, to 6 and from 6 to 7 we have our children's ministry functioning you know and it's a blessing that we can we can minister to the children this way and the children have been having a great time you know all this time engaging with their various teachers and it's a blessing that god has allowed that to happen then at 7 30 at 7 30 make a note of this midhurst ofn midhurst so if you are part of the midhurst ofn you know then um we have our fellowship time on sunday evening at 7 30. don't confuse the time seven o'clock the kids are um sorry six o'clock to seven ish the, the the kids are in children's ministry and children's church so mid heads your time begins at 7 30. so that will be for this weekend Praise the Lord. I hope you got those times together. Um, emails are being sent from your various OFN leaders. I believe you'll be getting another email reminder maybe tomorrow so that you know the times so you can join us. And I want everybody to be part of this, okay? All our young people, and I want to encourage you all, Route 18, you know, all of you should sign up for this. Don't, don't, this is not just about one group of people. We are all part of the family of God at PCC. So church family, you are reminded about this. Now, next week, next weekend, there's gonna be um, um, other Zones meeting. And the week after that, there's gonna be also other Zones meeting, but these are the two Zones that will be meeting this weekend. So I just wanted to remind you about that um, so that you can remember these announcements. Praise the Lord. All right let's see what questions we have over here now before we answer this question somebody asked me a question and i promise maybe to help a bit if you remember about first corinthians in chapter number 14 they said that um, that is not what i was teaching about but if i could shed some light on first corinthians chapter number 14 and um, i will quickly share a few things and then we it says from verse one to five so i read this um it says in first corinthians chapter 14 verse 1 to 5 he says pursue love and desire spiritual gifts but especially that you may prophesy for he who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men but to god for no one 
understands him. However, in the spirit, he speaks mysteries. But he who speaks, who prophesies, speaks edification and exaltation and comfort to men. He who speaks in a tongue edifies himself, but he who prophesies edifies the church. He says, I wish you all spoke with tongues, but even more that you may you, that you prophesy. For he who prophesies is greater than he who speaks in tongues, unless indeed he interprets that the church may receive edification. Now, the apostle first, first of all, in chapter number 12, you see that the nine gifts of the spirit, all right, the nine gifts of the spirit are mentioned in 1 Corinthians and chapter number 12, all right? So that's where you see the nine gifts of the spirit. Um, I have done a whole teaching on that and broken them for the sake of broken them up to show their vocal gifts, their three vocal gifts, their three power gifts, and their three revelation gifts, all right? But here, the apostle is teaching on the vocal gifts. You see, what are the vocal gifts? It's tongues, interpretation of tongues and prophecy, okay? Now, tongues, diversity of tongues. Now, one thing you have to understand is this. There is tongues, which is our prayer language. This is very close. So sometimes people uh, think that it's tongues is the gifts of the spirit. No, there's tongues that is given to the believer where we receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. When you go into the book of Acts, you see people receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit and they began to speak in tongues, all right? And then there are places that they spoke in tongues and prophesied. That means they moved in the gift of the they moved in the gift of prophecy. But tongues is our prayer language when you receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I like to call it that, just to differentiate. So he starts out by saying that we should pursue love. Why did he say that? Because when you go to chapter 13, you see that we have the great love chapter, which I, I, I joke about it, but it's the truth. Some people think that that chapter is just a beautiful chapter just to speak on at weddings. And, you know, but that chapter is an awesome, awesome spirit feel, spirit led chapter that we, that teaches on, on love. And really with respect is the fruit of the spirit how the fruit of the spirit, which deals with character, relates to the gifts of the spirit. You know, as a sandwich scripture, you have the gifts of the spirit in chapter, chapter, what do you call it? Chapter 12, you have the gifts of the spirit in chapter 14, and then you have in it, you have what we call the fruit of the spirit. And there is a, there's a correlation, okay? And <clears throat> so you, when you come to the book of Galatians, the Bible says that the fruit of the Spirit is love. The whole fruit of the Spirit is love. And then we see different manifestations of the fruit. So it says love is kind. Love is patient. Love is so and so. So that is Galatians chapter number five, I think from verse 19 or verse 20. That is where you see that. But here he's teaching us how <clears throat> to put ourselves in a place where God can move through us with the gifts of the Spirit. And we must desire to see God move to us. There must be a desire in us. That's what he's saying. We should pursue love. If you want to reference that, you can go to chapter number 13. Obviously, I can't teach it fully like I want to because I have to answer other questions. And he says we should desire the gifts of the Spirit. But it says especially that you may prophesy because he says, Prophecy, see, when you prophesy, prophesy, this is talking about the vocal gifts. Now, these vocal gifts are mainly the ones, you know, the vocal gifts really are for the church. When I say the church, all the gifts are for the church. But this is when we gather together as a church assembly, is the vocal gifts that uh, uh, must be really functioning amongst us. The rest of the gifts can function in the church and outside the church. That is the power gifts and the revelation gifts. They can function in the church and outside the church. But the vocal gifts specifically are for the assembly when they gather, all right? So you see, he says that, especially that you may prophesy because when you prophesy, it means that you bring forth a word of God in understanding. It's for the benefit of the whole, all right? So I like to explain this this way. He says, that you may prophesy, 
you because the gifts of the spirit, he says, pursue love. Because when you move in love, you look for the be- the, the, the love functions to, to the benefit of another. All right. So that's what he's trying to say. We should, we should, because what he's trying to say is that we must make ourselves vessels open to God so that God can use us to bless the rest. So he says that that you, especially that you may prophesy. Why is he saying you should prophesy? Because prophecy goes to bless others. I'm not saying you will not be blessed, he who prophesies, but you get to bless others. So Prophecy is public, all right? Then when you get into verse two, he says, he who speaks in in a tongue, all right, does not speak to men, but to God. This is your prayer language. When you are praying in your prayer language, that that it's not about, I'm not speaking to somebody else. Sometimes people say, we shouldn't pray in the spirit when we gather together, you know, um, in, in, in a congregation. Everything must be done in understanding. I understand what you're saying. But when we get together praying in the spirit, the agenda there is that maybe there's a prayer topic that has been mentioned and we are all praying in the spirit or maybe you are worshiping and we just best out worshiping in the spirit. And this is directed to God, is between the person and God. And so this scripture is dealing with private, okay? I like to put the word private there, okay? So the first one is, is that seek to do to prophesy to be a blessing to the rest of that is when we gather as a, as an assembly all right verse 2 says for he who speaks in a tongue that is your prayer language does not speak to men all right when i'm praying in the spirit i'm not speaking to men okay and he says that for no one understands him rightly so however in the spirit he speaks mysteries all right i'm speaking mysteries god understands it Man doesn't understand it because it's from spirit to spirit, all right? God is a spirit, and he dwells in me by his spirit. And when I begin to pray in the spirit, it's my spirit that is praying, all right, privately. Then verse 3 says, but he who prophesies speaks to the edification and exhortation and comfort of men, all right? He who prophesies. Now, this is not talking about the office of a prophet. This is talking about the gifts of prophecy. Okay, or the gift of prophecy. So he says that he who prophesies speaks to edify and to to comfort and to exalt. So this is a supernatural gift, a supernatural message brought forth. This is not preaching. Okay, when you're when you're preaching, it's not prophesying. Okay, but this is a supernatural message brought forth in understanding. Okay, not in tongues but in understanding so that people can understand in a language that people can understand. So in other words, if you're in, if you're in Italy, you will come forth uh, with a prophecy will come forth in Italian. If you are in England, it will come forth in a language that the people around you can hear. And that's, it's a message that comes forth. When I say it's a message, it's not a message as like I, like I teach or preach. No, this is a, a, a message that is supernaturally given to us by God. In other, and this is what it does. It comes to edify, it comes to exhort, and it comes to comfort men. Right. That is the limit. Let me say, I want to say limits of the gift of prophecy. The office of the prophet is different. For the sake of time, I cannot get into that. He who speaks in a tongue edifies himself. In other words, you pray in the Holy Spirit, you edify yourself. That is private. But he who prophesies, which is public, edifies the church. And he says, I wish you all spoke in tongues. God, Paul knows the benefits of speaking in tongues. He himself said, I speak in tongues more than you all. Okay. But he says in the public, I will use few words in tongues and rather make you understand. In other words, I dis- I seek to do what benefits the whole church in that sense. Here, he's saying that if you speak in tongues, Okay, he says, I wish that you all spoke in tongues. And now there's all baptized with the Holy Spirit, that is believers, because of the benefits of receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the benefits of speaking in tongues. Remember what I said when I was teaching, that you shall receive power after the Holy Spirit comes upon you. But he says, even more that you may prophesy. Why? 
because for he who prophesies is greater, greater not as a person, but what he is doing is public ministry, which is greater than the privateness of praying in the spirit. Okay, that's what he's saying. For he who prophesies is greater than he who speaks in tongues. Speaks in tongues means who speaks just in their private language. Because when I'm praying in the spirit, that has to just do with me and God. Then he says, unless indeed he interprets that the church may receive edification. In other words, if therefore he comes forth with diversity of tongues and the interpretation of those tongues, then it becomes prophecy, all right? That's what it's saying over here. Then it benefits the whole church. So there's a distinction here between private prayer language and then there is prophecy which goes to benefit the church. And then he shows us the parameters on which the, the prophecy must be is for edification, for exaltation, and for comfort. Not to reveal sin, that's not what the Bible says, is not to condemn. You know, because some people think prophecy is to condemn. That's not what he says, it's to edify, to, to, to comfort, and to exalt. So that's what I'll say about this. And um, I hope it, it helps or it, it has helped. Let's quickly go to our questions in, in that sense. It says, there's a cons the, there's conspiracy theory circulating regarding COVID vaccine, including 666 mark of the beast chips in it. As a Christian, uh, what should be our stance? Um, our stance, what should our stance be? Now, first of all, I've heard these things circulating and going around. Okay, I've heard a few things. I have not read about what this COVID, these vaccines are about, but there is all these conspiracy theories going about that the, conf, the, the different vaccines, I read a little bit about one vaccine, I don't know where it is. They said there is a chip that has been placed in it and when you're injected, the chip will go into your body and when it goes into your body, it then the people, um, you, you, it, it, the chip, obviously, because it is in you, um, information about you can be got by whatever in central intelligence that is, is monitoring that chip and all kinds of stuff. One thing I want to assure you about is this. No believer can get the mark of the beast. If you, are, you have crossed over from death to life, you can't get the mark of the beast. And even though the, the Bible talks about the mark of the beast, there is a spiritual side to it. The spiritual side to the, I mean, let me put it this way. It's a spiritual thing. The spiritual side to it uh, thing is this. It is people who have turned their hearts against God. That means they are unbelievers who do not want to know about God. You, the child of God, you are saved. You are born again. And you have crossed over from death to life. Another thing you want to understand is this. And I, this will become a bit more clear when I teach on the end time stuff. And I didn't want to start for this same reason that I know that if I start to teach on the end times, people will be shooting for the end of things, but we have to go from a certain point. The way I teach is I lay foundations and I build on it and bring it to a place where there's greater understanding of the, of the matter. So the mark of the beast, it is gonna come through the antichrist. And the Antichrist will not be revealed. The Bible says it categorically that the Antichrist will not be revealed until the church has been raptured. Simple. Until the church of the living God is raptured, that's when the Bible says the man of sin, which is the Antichrist, shall be revealed. Now, is he around now? I don't know. He is maybe, but he is not functioning because he can't function until the church is raptured. It's very clear in the scripture. You know, so child of God, just rest. Don't walk in fear. Uh, I, 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 I don't fully understand these vaccines. And as I've already got a couple of phone calls, people asking me about this, th these vaccines. I'm about to start reading about them and seeing what it says and so on and so forth. But what I'm trying to say is that it is not the mark of the beast. It is not. And if it is, then the church is going to be raptured before the first injection is given, if I look at scripture. So that would be my answer to that. It says, how do we foster a life of prayer? How do we encourage a life of prayer? Well, first of all, one of the things that I want to encourage you is this. 
Don't make prayer some big religious hoo-ha, okay? Prayer is talking to God, all right? It's talking to God. And one thing we want to understand is this, encouraging all of us to, to, to start to bring that as part of our lives, okay? So, you know, just, you know, making a, a thing where, for example, you know, you wake up in the morning and it's always good to do it when you wake up in the morning. So just make some time, start to make some time, you know, just a, a little adjustment of 15, 20 minutes to your schedule so that you can start to spend some time just praying to God, all right? And, 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 and you can make that time because people can make that. We make time for our Instagrams. We make time for our Facebooks and all these things that people get on and spend so much time. You know, for some reason, I, I, um, I'm on Facebook, but what happened was something happened a few years ago. Everybody had to re register for Facebook and I didn't do it. I'm not a big time Facebook person. I'm not against it for your information. I'm not against it. You know, I'm just saying that use all these things strategically for the glory of God. That's my thing. I'm not about against it. But but for some reason, I, I was not being able to get on Facebook. It didn't bother me. I just continued to do what I do. But there was a, the in you know, I use uh, an, an Apple phone um, and an iPad. There was some kind of update. And all of a sudden, I realized that my Facebook had connected again. Um, I did not connect it for some reason it did. And do you know what? I went onto a particular page and suddenly I found myself an hour later, I was just scrolling through different things, looking at different people, you know, obviously people who supposedly were my friends on Facebook. And do you know what? I just realized that just like that, I was sitting on this thing for one hour, looking at different people's pictures and their poses and things that they were saying and birthdays that they were celebrating and restaurants that they were eating at and pictures that, and I said, oh, you see how this thing takes your time? And I'm not saying you shouldn't do it, but I'm just saying to the same or just to a little uh, amount of time that you make an adjustment, that's what you have to do. Just make a little adjustment where you can say, Lord, I am going to give you, um, you're not saying to God, but that's what you're saying. I'm, I'm going to spend this 15 minutes, 20 minutes with you before I set off to go and do my, my work, go to work or go and log in if you're working from home. And you will be surprised what the changes that will begin to come into your life. All right, so just a little uh, note there. That is how you begin. And you'll be surprised that as you get into it, you just, a desire just to build, comes to, starts building up and you wanna spend more time with God in your life because there's a joy that comes with spending time in the presence of God. The next, um, the next uh, question says, when you talk about constant prayer, do we have to do this both individually or corporate, corporately? If so, why? Well, when I talk about constant prayer, constant prayer must be in our life. We must be praying consistently as individuals. And then also corporately as a church, there must be prayer going on corporately as times of prayer going on in that sense, corporately as a church in that sense. Um, I believe that that must happen. We have a prayer team in our church. I don't know who's the person who's asking this question, but there's, we have a prayer team and, and they gather together consistently to pray um, on, on different days of, of the week. And I believe that that is so powerful and, and, and it's important that corporate prayer, we can go through scripture where we see corporate prayer going on. And at the same time, individual prayer too is so important. One of the things that I want to say is this, it is important that as an individual, you have that prayer life as an individual. Sometimes we, and I've seen this happen, where people's prayer life is purely connected to the corporate prayer life of the church, which has its place. But we as individuals must have our own prayer time, times of devotion and times of prayer. That consistency must be in us and with us as individuals, okay? I hope that helped. It says, should, 
Should we use the Lord's Prayer to help us pray? Um, <laughs> one of the things, when you say help us pray, the Lord's Prayer, first of all, I, let me mention this, and I've taught about it. I didn't get into it today because I didn't, that's not where I was going towards. But the Lord's Prayer, you see that people repeat the Lord's Prayer. They don't even understand it. And first of all, the Lord's Prayer, really strictly speaking, is not the Lord's Prayer. I know everywhere. I know I'm, I'm going into very uh, uh, serious territory because one, it was the disciples that asked him to teach them to pray. So if, if anything, it should be called the disciples prayer because he taught the disciples to pray, but hey, you don't have to make anything of that. But the Lord's Prayer, which we know as our Father who art in heaven, first and foremost, what you have to understand, is not a prayer that was supposed to be repeated. It's in the scripture. When you study the scripture, he says, he is so interesting when you go into the scripture, he says, do not use these vain repetitions and so on and so forth. And right after that, he says, pray in this manner. Okay. And the manner doesn't mean repeat it. Okay. So he set a guideline for prayer. But another thing you have to understand is this, the prayer, that prayer that we call the Lord's prayer, the truth of it is that it's a bona fide prayer for the old covenant. It is not for the new, okay? When you study it carefully, it's not for the new, all right? Because it says, thy kingdom come. The kingdom of God has already come. It's already come. It's dwelling in the hearts of men. So that alone negates the prayer. Now, I know this is serious territory in which I'm going in, but if I did a proper study on it, or we do a proper study on it, it's, an, it's a nice framework you know, in terms of, it begins by saying, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, which we say is, a, is, is, a, is an example of, you know, worshiping God and praying and worshiping God, which is important. The Bible talks about we should enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. And that is a good way of starting out to pray, you know, to, to, in the time of prayer, where you, you come into the presence of God, thanking him and praising him. And it's very scriptural to do that, okay? And, and, and different, there are different, different things that you can take out of there um, and employ them in your, in, in your prayer. Have you noticed that that prayer doesn't end by saying in Jesus' name? It doesn't end by that. Whilst Jesus said, when you come into the book of John, the Bible tells us that Jesus said, from this moment on, he says, you've not asked me anything, um, but now when you pray, pray in the name of Jesus. Jesus was setting some other precedent in that sense. Okay, so the Lord's Prayer, which obviously has become a prayer that people, I mean, I could repeat the reason why I know the Lord's Prayer, because since you're a kid, you know, they just say, pray the Lord's Prayer, and you begin to, I could rattle that prayer in so many seconds, and it's done. But what I got results from it, I did not know whether, you know, I did not know whether, you know, you've got anything out of it. You know, it's just something that I repeated. I just rattled it in that sense. So, that is something that I wanted you to know in that sense. So you can get some truths out of it and apply it into prayer, but it's not about repeating the prayer because what you get, now you, I always say this, now if you've been praying the Lord's Prayer and you're getting results with what you do, then don't mind me. You know, if, if it's not broken, why fix it in that sense? But, you know, we, 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 it's been used religiously on all kinds of fronts my, my question is that, are you getting results when you pray the Lord's Prayer? Okay, so that is worth thinking about in that sense. Okay, are there different types of prayer? Yes, there are different types of prayer. And I'll give you a few examples. There's a prayer of intercession, what we talked about, okay? The prayer of intercession is a prayer that you pray, you know, you pray for someone else. That's the prayer of intercession. There's the prayer of faith. Okay, the Bible says that is any sick among you in the book of James, let, let them uh, uh, pray for this person, anointing him with oil, and the prayer of faith will heal the sick. And if he's committed any sins, it shall be forgiven him. So there is a prayer of intercession, and there's a prayer of faith, which is the prayer of petition. 
Okay, so there is that kind of prayer as well. All right, so there's two prayers. But in the, when you study the scriptures in the New Testament, you in the, under the New Covenant, you will notice that there are about six different kinds of prayer. There's a scripture I want to take you to because you asked that question. Come with me to the book of Ephesians. Come with me to the book of Ephesians and chapter number, go to Ephesians chapter number six, right? You can go to it or you can write it down. And Paul teaching about the, the, the um, I'll say the weapons of our warfare. When you get to verse number 14, it says, therefore, having gathered your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness and having shot your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one and take the helmet of salvation and the soul of the spirit, which is the word of God. Now it is praying all with, with all prayer and supplication in the spirit, being watchful to this end with, with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Now, verse 18, it says, praying always with all prayer and supplication. Now, that word all prayer or that statement all prayer is, is all kinds of prayer, okay? All kinds of prayer. In the Amplified, it reads like this, pray all at all times, on every occasion, in every season, in the spirit. So in the spirit, praying the spirit is a kind of prayer. With Then he says, with all manner of prayer, all manner of prayer. The word manner there is all kinds. There are different kinds of prayer, okay? And one of the things you have to understand is that prayer, prayer is like, has different guidelines, okay? For example, you can't pray the prayer of intercession. Oh, let me put it to you. There are different guidelines for the prayer of intercession to the prayer of faith, all right? Every prayer must be prayed in faith. The Bible says that he that cometh unto God must believe that he is, and he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So we have to come to God in faith, all right? So every time we come to God, we come in faith. In prayer, we come in faith. But... The prayer of intercession is a prayer that we pray in behalf of another, all right? Like how do we pray for the release of Peter? We pray in behalf of another. You don't pray the prayer of intercession when you're looking for a job. You don't, all right? Because for a job for yourself, you don't pray. You pray the prayer of faith. You ask God for, that's where the Bible says in the book of Mark, chapter 11, verse 23 and 24, what things soever you desire when you pray, Believe that you receive them and you shall have it. So the prayer of faith is a prayer of petition. You ask, you believe that you receive. And the Bible says that you begin to declare what the word of God says. All right. So when you have time, go check the book of Mark chapter 11 and verse 23 and 24. It will also show you another side or another type of prayer. Okay. The next question says, what should you remember when you pray? When pr what should you remember when your prayers seem to go unanswered? What should you remember? Hmm, that's very, I don't know what to say about this. I don't know whether the person is saying, what should you have on your mind or what you should, you know, one of the things is this, if you pray or when you pray, once you have prayed in faith, you must understand. And it's on the basis of the word of God, God has answered your prayer. But whatever it is, when you pray, it, it takes time for the prayer to be manifested. Okay, very, very important. It takes time. Now, when I say it takes time, even if it is between the time you prayed and when it happened, even if it took three minutes, there was a three-minute time for the prayer to be answered. Not because God took three minutes to answer it. No. No. It is the manifestation of it. But between the time of prayer and the manifestation of the prayer of what you ask, what you do in between there is very important. 
That is where you begin to meditate and declare the word of God concerning what you have believed God for. Okay, so I, I'm, I'm just making this up because I'm, the, the question is not very clear in that sense. It says, what should you remember when prayers seem to go unanswered? So I'm, I'm thinking that the person has prayed and then it looks like you're not getting the manifestation of the prayer yet. And what you have to do is meditate the word of God in those areas. When you are reminded, oh, you prayed, you never got the job or you didn't get this, that is when you come back to the word of God and you declare promotion does not come from the east or the west. Promotion comes from God. You know, you begin to find scriptures in the area that you of what you prayed about and you begin to speak that and begin to thank God for, for answered prayer. All right, I hope that helps. I hope. Now, it says here, the last question says, Pastor, is there any reason why the man at the gate was never healed healed in Jesus' time, even though this seems like the way they traveled at that time? Very good question. There is no reason. There's no reason. It's just theologians and Bible historians looked at everything and they said, Jesus must have passed this man by. Um, but one thing you have to understand is this. When Jesus walked the face of this earth or the places he ministered, even though he healed several people, one of the things you have to understand is that there are people too who did not get healed, not that because Jesus did not minister. Maybe they, were, they did not receive healing from Jesus. They didn't come around. What you have to understand is that people are people, you know, People are people. There are people who, if God was moving powerfully in a place and people were getting healed and, and delivered and stuff like that, there are people who will still be anti it. It's there's people, you know. And so the fact that Jesus walked in, in Israel doesn't mean that everybody, think about this. I think Jesus raised, to my remembrance, he raised three people from the dead in the time of his ministry. Now watch this, Jesus was here for 33 years, three, three and a half, I think, years. His ministry was, was three years from when he was 30. When the Holy Ghost came upon him, it, that started his ministry. He was not in ministry, or oh, there's no record of him healing the sick or anything. The only thing record we have is Jesus is born. And then another time when they went back, I think to be counted, uh, population, uh, you know, something was being done and they went back to be counted if I'm right and they were coming and then they couldn't find Jesus. And the Bible says that they look for him, look for him and they found him with all these teachers of the, of the law and scribes and he was just answering their questions and teaching them and they were just astounded at the knowledge of this young man. I think he was about 12 years old. So, so there you go. That is what we have. But even there, we don't see him. We don't hear he healed anybody or anything of the sort. One of the things that we see is that he, he grew in knowledge, all right? And when he says he grew in knowledge, that means he studied the word of God. Because even though Jesus was God, Jesus was also 100% man. So even the simple, the scripture even saying that he grew tells you if God grows, then we are in trouble. But in the natural, Jesus grew. You understand? Jesus grew in the natural because he was 100% God. He was 100% man. Even though he limited his aspect is areas of deity, all right? The coming together, there's a big theological name for that, coming together of God and man, what we call the hypostatic union. The coming together of humanity and deity was found only in Jesus Christ, all right? Angels are not man and God coming together because angels are not God. Angels are spirit beings. They can manifest. God allows them to for us to manifest in the natural, for us to see them, that is if he chooses to, but Jesus Christ was the only God man. He was 100% God, he was 100% man, okay? But he put a limitation of his, on his God side, you know, um, he put it away like the Bible said, and he operated like a man and dealed with the power of God. That is how he operated on the face of this earth. So the miracles that Jesus did, he didn't do as God. He did with like as a man filled with the power of God. That is why the Bible says he waited and then he received the, 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 the endowment, you know, after he was baptized 
And then from there, his ministry um, um, took off. Now, as to why that man by the gate beautiful, even though it's not in the scripture, it's just saying where he was seated, Jesus must have, because Jesus came to the temple. Okay, so if this man was crippled from birth, somewhere he must have known Jesus was there. That's all I can say, but the Bible doesn't tell us why he was not healed during Jesus' ministry. What we know is that the disciples met with him and he was begging for arms and they said, look upon us. Flesh, I mean, uh, silver and gold do, we don't have, but such as we have, you know, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk, and that's what happened, and he walked, okay? So, obviously, this story tells me, and is in telling us that there is more work to be done, and you as a child of God, filled with the Holy Spirit, can go forth and do the works that Jesus has put in our power to do, okay? And there's a lot of ground to cover. So, that's what I can say about it. The scripture does not give us the reason. I just brought it up because it's, it, it was around the temple and it was just around the time. This is just a few, uh, uh, maybe months after Jesus had gone to heaven. So that man should have been around when Jesus' ministry went on around the temple. Okay. So that is my answer to that. Praise the Lord. I hope that um, this evening has been helpful. And um, we will pick up from where I left off next week. There are some very exciting things coming up. We'll be telling you that on Sunday um, for, for after Bible study. The next few Thursdays, what you understand, there's, there's a Thursday, the 17th, um, this special program we're going to tell you about. And then there's the Thursday, the 24th, which is uh, Christmas Eve. Uh, we're going to have a Christmas Eve service. Um, we don't normally have a Christmas Day service, so we're going to have a Christmas Eve service. And then we're going to have uh, a 31st uh, night service into the... So those, all those fall on a Thursday and there'll be no Bible study. So our last Bible study for the year will be next week, Thursday. And on Sunday, we'll have a number of announcements for you. Praise the Lord. Well, God richly bless you. Ooh, is that the time? It's, it is 9.16. Ooh, I didn't realize that we, we, we have gone a little bit more over our time um, tonight. And, um, but I hope that it's been a blessing and it's wonderful to be with you once again. God richly bless you. We'll catch up with you soon.